check, check, mic check, 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 mic check. <laughs> Welcome to Podcast Envy, a production of the Creative Imposter Studios. I'm Andrea Clunder, your podcast boss and the original creative imposter. Today, we begin a new series. We just wrapped up our series on podcasting and imposter syndrome with some amazing interviews. Well, I thought they were amazing. I don't know if you did. And we are now bridging into a new series all about podcasting and social impact, making a podcast that matters. And today I am talking with Beth O'Connor of the soon-to-be-released podcast, The Rural Health Voice. Beth is the executive director of the Virginia Rural Health Association. And originally, Beth responded to my inquiry about podcasters talking about podcasting and imposter syndrome because, well, she hasn't launched yet, and that was one of the obstacles. Can anyone relate? Fortunately, 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 she has recorded a few episodes, they are being edited, and they will be coming out soon. And so... We do talk a little bit about imposter syndrome on this episode because, well, I just can't stop myself. And we also talk about podcasting for nonprofit organizations because Beth is not starting a podcast because she was dying to have a podcast of her own. It is now part of her job. And I think there are some listeners who can relate where You have been innocently working along in your job or your organization and your boss, supervisor, board member, someone says to you, we need a podcast. And suddenly this becomes your responsibility. And so then if you've never made a podcast before, what do you do? You are going to find out what Beth did and is doing as you listen to this episode. And before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that there is yet another Podcast Envy free class coming up at Nextdoor Chicago. Three elements your podcast is missing. Really? I wonder what they could be. Coming up Wednesday, September 26th, 2018 at Nextdoor Chicago at 6.30 p.m. You can RSVP for free on their website. And of course, I will link to it for you in the show notes for this episode. All right, cool. Here we go. My conversation with Beth O'Connor of the soon-to-be-released Rural Health Voice podcast. Beth O'Connor, thank you so much for joining me on Podcast Envy. Thank you. So, Beth, you are a soon-to-be getting-ready-to-launch podcaster with the Rural Health Voice. When I put out a call for people to talk about imposter syndrome in podcasting, you reached out to me and said, what if imposter syndrome is the reason why I haven't started podcasting yet? Is that a good thing to talk about? (laughs) And I thought that would be perfect. So tell me a little bit about why that post stood out to you and how it is relevant to, at least in that moment, which was uh, probably a little over a month ago, maybe two months ago when I first put that out. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been spending probably the last six months trying to figure out all of the pieces I need to pull together for a podcast. And I swear every time I figure one piece out, another piece I didn't know existed pops up. I feel like I'm playing podcast whack-a-ball. Oh, you need a hosting service. Oh, you need a recording thing. Oh, you need this. You need a microphone. You need a headset. You need that, 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 that. I'm like, ah! Uh, and so that was about the time where, where your you know, kind of call for guests popped up. I was just completely weirding out over the fact that I have no idea what I'm doing. So if you have no idea what you're doing, why are you doing it? <laughs> Therein lies the question. So a little bit of background. I'm the executive director of the Virginia Rural Health Association. And so the podcast isn't for me. It's for the association. And about a year ago, my board president, who is a total podcast junkie, looked at me and went, hey, we should do a podcast. And I went, huh? I had listened to maybe two or three podcast episodes Ever. Wow. I had a very vague idea of what a podcast 
was and what you could do with it. So my first kind of gut reaction was, you've got to be kidding me. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, the more I looked into it, learned about podcasts, listened to other podcasts, learned about, you know, what could really be done and specifically how having a podcast could call attention to the issues we're trying to promote. I got really excited about it. What are some of the issues that you are dealing with and messages that you're promoting? Sure. So with the Virginia Rural Health Association, uh, we're an, a nonprofit advocacy organization working to improve health and health care in rural Virginia. And with that, there's all sorts of issues with our small towns and our rural communities. We've got a conference coming up this fall, and some of the things we're going to look at is the opioid crisis and how that's, you know, we can work with that in our rural communities, how to increase community capacity, looking at broadband and lack of broadband services in rural communities and how that in turn impacts health and health care, health literacy, emergency medical services, behavioral health, all of those issues, you know, pretty much any issue you can think about in relation to health, how that then plays out in rural communities and the additional barriers that are there in terms of resources, in terms of lack of transportation, in terms of distance, all of those things pull together. Mm. Did you say that you work in an office by yourself? Yeah, well, I forget. It was myself for so long, I forget I now have somebody else. I've been in this position for coming up on 13 years now, and I just hired my first staff member in October of last year. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, I was excited. I can imagine. I mean, I just said that because that is a lot to deal with. There's a lot of different issues that you're working with, and you interface with policymakers and legislators at state and federal level? Yes, lots of times. What are in the research that you did and in thinking about how to create this podcast, what are some of the things that you discovered that really got you excited about podcasting and about how and why this will be something that will be a really useful resource for you? Right. So as I started looking at the podcast, one of the things I reached out to a Facebook group that's specifically for executive directors of uh, profit organizations and said, hey, is anybody else doing a podcast? But of course, the joy of social media, sure enough, somebody else is doing a podcast. Mm -hmm. It is not only doing a podcast, but is doing a podcast about nonprofits that podcast. Oh, so this is, you know, yeah, it was, it was this fabulous resource. So I, I got on the phone with her and talked to her about what we wanted to do. And she was really excited about, you know, the concept of our podcast when something that she said that was really encouraging was, you know, one of the struggles podcasters first have is finding a way to call attention to their program and getting people to kind of check it out for the first time. Yeah. And one of the things that we have going for us is since we're a member-based advocacy organization, we have a thousand people on our email newsletter list that get an email from us every Monday. Mm -hmm. So we already had that set core group of people that are interested about the topic that already receive information from us to start with as our base. So when your board president suggested to you or strongly suggested to you yes. that you should start a podcast and you had that first, huh, what? You know, I've only listened to a couple of things. I barely know what a podcast is. From there, where did the imposter syndrome start to set in and, and how did you feel like it was holding you back? As I was doing all of this kind of background information gathering stuff, looking at various things on the internet, whatever else, one thing I kept seeing was people talking about how time intensive podcasting is, all the work that goes into you know, the background, researching topics, setting up you know, episode ideas, all the time it takes to do editing and mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. And that's the part that I really like. What am I getting myself into? I, you know, I already have a job. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a lot of extra time in that job to be fooling around with something else. And so that's the part that's really intimidating for me is, you know, you see a post maybe on Facebook of somebody saying they were up till 2 a.m. editing their podcast. I'm like, no, I can't <laughs> do that. So what are you doing to sort of make sure that that doesn't happen? <laughs> So a big thing with that was I decided that I am not going to edit this thing myself. Mm -hmm. We decided it's worth the investment to go ahead and pay someone who actually knows what they're doing with sound equipment, have them do the editing so that I'm not doing that in-house. Super smart. You're doing mostly interviews, right? Almost entirely interviews. Okay. And you're the one doing the interviews. So you're the one hosting? 
Correct. And had you ever done any kind of interviewing or anything like that before? Yeah. So strangely enough, when my president had this idea, my gut reaction was, I have never done anything like this ever before in my life. And then I got to think about it. I went, oh, yeah, I had my own television show. Why? What? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So, and we're talking 15 some odd years ago. Uh-huh. I lived in a little town in Arizona and the local local television station had its own little shows. And I had a show called Around the Town with Beth O'Connor, where I interviewed various people like the leaders of the local Elk Club on their upcoming fundraiser or the director of the health department on some new public health message they were trying to get out. You know, totally homegrown, Corey kind of interviews, but I have done interviews before. Well, look at that. I think sometimes people sort of hear podcasting and then they forget about things that they have done in the past that will help support them. People forget about, oh, yeah, I had that experience working for the newspaper or working on the TV show or, oh, yeah, I have public speaking experience or I have theater performance experience or whatever it is. And I think that different people have different ways into what their strengths are going to be as a podcaster. Right. And so part of what I'm looking at is, you know, as director of a nonprofit, you know, I'm very frequently asked to speak to groups. So I already spend a lot of time with a microphone in front of my face. It's just that now it's the microphone in my computer as opposed to the microphone and a whole bunch of people looking back at me (laughs) wondering what on earth I'm talking about. And so you've already started, even though the show at the time of this recording is not launched yet, you've already started working on the show. So where are you right now in the process? What have you already done? So at this point, I've recorded two episodes. Our sound guy is still working on them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to do another one next week. And once those are finished, we're going to go ahead and launch. It's podcast angel time. For some reason, I've gotten like really into singing on these promo spots. I don't know why. Today, the podcast angel is podcast envy. Hmm? Podcast envy is the angel of podcast envy. Why? Yes, because what I'm talking about is the podcast envy launch pod is that? That is an opportunity for you, the aspiring podcaster. Yeah, you. I know you haven't started your show yet. You've been thinking about it. You've been mulling it over. Maybe you even bought a microphone and maybe you even recorded an episode, but you haven't quite launched. And I want to help you. I have been offering Podcast Envy VIP launch services one-on-one and have helped fabulous podcasters like Lisa Lackey of Inside Out Conversations and Dina Ranade of An Herbal Diary launch their podcasts. And now I want to help you. And I want to do it in a group. Why? Because I think it'll be fun. And because it will save you a little bit of money or a lot of bit of money off the VIP one-on-one rate. And if you are thinking, that's cool, but I am totally going to launch my show in January, fresh for 2019. Great idea. Let me tell you that you are going to need to have your show ready by December to get it into the Apple directory for January because they get a lot of new podcast submissions at that time. They also take a break for the holidays on approving new shows. So if you want to make a podcast that matters... You want it to sound amazing from the beginning, and you want to get it into the Apple directory and all other directories by the start of the year. You are going to want to check out the Podcast Envy Launch Pod. There is limited space and limited time. You need to reach out to me no later than October 5th in order to be considered for the Launch Pod. There is, of course, a link in the show notes for this episode that will take you right to the LaunchPod information. And if, for whatever reason, you're listening on an app that doesn't support links, annoying, then you can go directly to thecreativeimposter.com forward slash launch pod. Thecreativeimposter.com forward slash launch pod, P-O-D, and you will get all the details on how to join. See you there. What have you been enjoying the most so far about putting together the rural health? I can't even say that word. That's one of those words for me. Rural health voice podcast. 
Yeah, and, and we actually had a giant debate on whether or not we should call it the World Health Voice for that exact reason, because people don't hear that word. I kept having to explain the podcast moment that it wasn't World Health Voice, it was Rural Health Voice. Anyway, so what have I been enjoying the most? You know, really talking to other podcasters has been fascinating. Just connecting with people on what are you doing and how are you doing it. When I was at Podcast Movement, literally everybody I met, I downloaded their podcast because <laughs> I wanted to get a, a feel for the different styles of podcasts are out there and, and, and what people are doing. You know, obviously some of them I won't have a big interest in and I'll maybe listen to you know, one episode or two mm-hmm. and then delete it. But it's been really fascinating to look at the breadth and the depth of the different kinds of podcasts that are out there. It's just fascinating. So you definitely are becoming more of a podcast listener as well through the process of becoming a podcaster. Oh, absolutely. I had not I think downloaded a single podcast episode before. I'd listened to a couple that my husband had when we were on a road trip or something, but never listened to it on my own. I often think with a lot of independent podcasters that, I don't know, I guess I always used to have an assumption that you wouldn't become a podcaster unless you were already a podcast fan. Like if you were already a listener, it's a shorter bridge to becoming someone who creates podcasts. But the more that I talk to other podcasters and other people whether you're making one for a company or an organization or whether you are making it independently, I find that that's not always true. A lot of times people start with wanting to make the podcast and then they become podcast listeners. Or or in some cases, they actually don't. They just make their podcast and they still don't listen to anybody else's show. Right. What do you think is going to be your biggest strength as a podcaster? Again, because we've got you know, this sort of established existence, you know, I'm really able to pull from a lot of experts, the state, the national level to get their insights on on various and sort of issues, whether that's somebody leading a grassroots effort in their community, or if that's somebody in a federal department up in D.C. I've been able to access people at pretty much any level. That's really amazing. I was going to ask you, actually, whether it's been easy to get yeses and schedule the people that you want to talk with, or whether you've had any difficulties or challenges getting certain people scheduled. And at this point, you know, since we just started, and the only guests I try to schedule are people who have already agreed to speak at our conference in the fall. That's obviously been easier. Yeah. I don't know, you know, going down the road, if it's still going to be easy, you know, maybe not so much. And I think part of the tricky thing with that may be there may be a particular hot topic that I want to get somebody really important in on, but because it's a hot topic, they're going to be really busy. Mm -hmm. So I think that could be very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. If you do get somebody on a hot topic issue, do you think that getting a level of candidness or... Mm, getting away from like political talking points. Is that something that you're trying to do? Is that something that you're nervous about? Well, you know, you got to figure pretty much anybody that works for the federal government is going to be restricted on what they feel comfortable saying. Yeah, That's just the way it is. But, you know, being able to ask good questions and and get some solid information is going to be worth that. Is there anything that you dislike so far about the podcasting process since you were smart enough to outsource your editing? Not, yeah, I've only recorded a couple episodes, so not thus far. I'm sure there'll <laughs> be something that comes up. And then what would be your your best outcome or vision? I know that you're just getting started and you're just kind of figuring out how everything works. But in terms of social impact and in terms of using the podcast to leverage the work that you're already doing, what would be your vision for the future or the best possible outcome specifically for the podcast itself? Yeah, so since we're an advocacy organization, you know, if if we have a podcast on a particular topic and we inspire someone to pick up the phone and call their member of Congress or send an email to their senator, that's where the rubber meets the road, that actual do something about this particular topic that you're interested in. What have been some of the most pressing topics that you're planning to address on the podcast right away? Broadband expansion is a big thing for us, especially in terms of of telemedicine in rural communities, emergency medical services, making sure that people have a a way to get to care when they absolutely need it. We're looking at some behavioral health issues. We're looking very closely at the opioid crisis and how that's playing out in rural America. Do you think that your show is 
is it specific to Virginia or do you think it's applicable to rural areas throughout the entire country? We're not limiting to Virginia. I yeah. mean, we're telling a lot of the stories from a Virginia perspective, yeah. but we're not just going to look at Virginia issues. You know, when you, when you look about those topics, you know, broadband access, that's a big issue, yeah. no matter where you are in rural America. It's hard here in Appalachia because of the mountains, but it's also a big deal out in some of the mountain states where you have miles and miles between communities to be able to cover. It's a big deal everywhere. And so many of those issues are going to translate regardless. And also, you know, if we're talking to folks at the federal level, the decisions they're making are just going to impact Virginia. They're going to impact everybody. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. How do you plan on or do you have a plan for getting more listenership beyond the thousand people on your mailing list? Ooh, (laughs) (laughs) that's a good question. (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, so, so certainly, you know, st- starting with those people, it would, of course, you know, we'll push our episodes on social media and with Twitter and with Facebook. And with that, I'm hoping that some of the guests that we have um, are going to be high enough profile. They'll attract, you know, people from other sectors. And also some of the topics that I th- think are going to be cross-cutting. Again, things like the broadband issue. It's a big deal for health access, but it's also a big deal for business development in other areas. And do you have, and you you may not have an answer to this yet, and I'm asking you this because as I work with my nonprofit client, we have some of the same questions or thoughts, which are, you know, sometimes people will measure the success of their podcast based on how many people are downloading. So your download statistics, right? Oh, we have this many people who downloaded this many episodes and it's growing at this rate. And there are some people who want to make money from their podcast. So that could be through sponsorships and affiliates that could be through promoting their business or their service offerings or their product offerings and, and getting more sales or more client leads. And then for a nonprofit, though, with advocacy, if you're talking about social impact, it's not as easy to measure whether the money that's being invested, money, time, and resources being invested in the production of the podcast are paying off, it's a little bit harder to measure that return on investment because you're not trying to make money off of it or sell something. And the download numbers don't necessarily accurately measure what you said would be a measure of success, which is people actually taking action on the issues. So have you discussed with your board or thought about how to measure the success of the podcast in terms of return on investment? And that one's tricky. I mean, we, we struggle with that with our electronic newsletter as well. You know, just because we send it out to a thousand people doesn't mean a thousand people open it. It certainly doesn't mean a thousand people read all the articles in that newsletter. Of course. But with the podcast, and one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping to use is with the show notes, obviously, if somebody goes to the show notes and clicks a link that says, contact your senator now, that's going to be an outcome. Mm-hmm. So just looking at ways that you can measure action that's being taken as a result of listenership. Right. Right. Beth, do you have any advice for the podcaster? No, I'm going to change this question a little bit for you. Do you have <laughs> Do you have any advice not for the podcaster who had their own idea to start a podcast and haven't started yet, but for the employee, staff member, member of an organization or group to whom it has been suggested that part of their job will be to create a podcast? And they're like, ah, I know nothing about podcasting. <laughs> what would be your best <laughs> advice for that person? Oh, my goodness. Well, well two things. I, I think if somebody looks at you and says, hey, you should start a podcast, the first question out of your mouth should be, okay, and how are we going to pay to launch that? Because, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, there's obviously fees and purchases and stuff to be made. I got real lucky with this. One of the things when someone first looked at me and said, hey, we should do podcast, I was like, sure, let me write a grant and we'll see if we can get the startup costs covered. And if, if we get the grant, then we'll look at a podcast. And that was kind of me hedging my bets, mm-hmm. except we got the grant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it's like, oh, I have to start a podcast. Stop. Uh, but you know, with that, we were able to you know, set aside money for microphones, for headsets, for hosting services, 
for recording services for software. And so, you know, if part of your job is to be able to do this, make sure there are funds set aside to be able to support that. So I would say that's absolutely you know, thing number one. Was your grant specifically for the podcast or was it a bigger grant that included the podcast among other things? Nope, this was specifically, and so I'll, I'll give a shout out, uh, the National Rural Health Association, we operate under their umbrella. They have uh, many grants for state associations like Virginia Rural Health Association mm. to be able to launch various projects. You know, you can do it for all sorts of things. We applied and received a grant to cover all of our startup costs for the first year, which is fabulous. That's amazing. Um, so really appreciate, you know, what they're doing to be able to support our message. Thanks to the, to the National Health Association. And with that, I should also thank the Virginia State Office of Rural Health because they've agreed to be our first sponsor. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you have the funding and the resources set aside to get yourself set up with equipment, with hosting fees, with software, and that you know how much all of that is going to cost and that you can have those costs covered. And then you said you had another piece of advice? Yeah, get on the internet and start digging. There's there's lots of great information out there. But once you start digging around, you keep finding more and more and more and more. So just keep digging. Mm-hmm. Definitely true. Would you say that making the investment and going to podcast movement, even though you hadn't launched yet, was a worthwhile investment? Uh, it was absolutely worth it. One, in just, you know, picking up tricks and ideas and tools and resources. And that was the part that I went for. And that was great. But the part that was really helpful for me was absolutely everybody I talked to where I said, hey, we're looking at launching this podcast. It's called The Rural Health Voice. It's about health and healthcare in rural America. Everybody was like, oh, wow, that's a great idea. So if, if you're stuck with imposter syndrome, talking to other podcasters is a great way to get leveraged back up again. Where can our listeners go to learn more about the Rural Health Voice and the work that you're doing? So if you go to the Virginia Rural Health Association website, which is vrha.org, mm -hmm. on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a tab that says Rural Health Voice. Click mm -hmm. on that tab and away you go. And I have two last questions for you. One is... Who is in the photo with you that you sent me for promoting this episode? <laughs> that is Romeo. That is my combination of who knows what kind of background dog. He, he was a, a shelter dog. We have got him when we're guessing he was about five years old, but we're not really sure because he'd been astray. He's been with us, I think, four years now. He looks very happy. <laughs> yes, he's a happy dog. <laughs> and uh, the last question that I wanted to ask, is there anything else that you want to share with our podcast Envy listeners? Listen to Rural Health Voice. Podcast Envy is produced by your podcast boss, Andrea Klunder. That's me. The Podcast Envy theme music is by Valentin Sosnitsky, courtesy of the Free Sound Project at freesound.org. And our podcast angel music is by Benjamin Masterpolito, also on freesound.org as Lemon Cream. All music is licensed under the Creative Commons. Our episodes are mixed by Edwin Ruiz. And hey, if you want your show to sound as good as ours, hire us. Put the magic audio mojo of the Creative Imposter Studios to work for you. Thanks so much for listening, and here's to making your podcast the envy of everyone else. <laughs>